before Mark's um, open lecture today. Um, it's probably the only time you will see me with a shirt and a blazer, so take time to uh, make fun of me while you can. Um, so I'll just briefly introduce Mark and then I'll give it the floor to him. Um, and so it's my great pleasure to introduce Mark Blythe, the William R. Rhodes 57 Professor of International Economics at the Watson Institute for International and Public Affairs at Brown University. Being a first generation born in Scotland, he earned a PhD from the University of Columbia in 1999 and taught at the John Hopkins University until 2009 when he moved to Brown. He's one of the main references in contemporary political economy research and has made seminal contributions to several timely and policy-oriented topics such as inflation and austerity. Um, I think we can all agree that Marx's reputation precedes him. In my case, um, I came to contact with Marx's work during my PhD while studying anti-austerity mobilization in Southern Europe. His work on austerity was crucial uh, for my understanding of it as a deeply moral idea where class politics abounded. Um, therefore, given his influence in my own work, last year while I was visiting and teaching at Brown University, I wrote, I wrote to Mark and very kindly he immediately invited me to attend to his in very insight insightful course, Money and Power in International Political Economy, which was really good. <laughs> Thanks Thank for you. that. <laughs> As Mark himself says, he's a political economist whose research focus, focuses upon how uncertainty and randomness impact co complex systems, particularly economic system, and why people continue to believe stupid economic ideas, despite the buckets of evidence to the contrary, right? Um, regarding this, I would like to highlight two of his books, who are passing around. Um, the Great Transformations, where he develops and engages with Karl Polanyi's work to explain institutional change in the US and Sweden post-Second World War, and Austerity, a uh, history of dangerous idea where he shows quite clearly why austerity does not work, and it will only result in the shrinking of the economy, and pretty obviously open the door to what we see today in Europe, in terms of political um, landscape. The second stream of his research focuses on the political economy of rich democracies and resulted in books such as The Future of the Euro, Angronomics, and The New Politics of Growth and Stagnation. Today, uh, Mark will present us his forthcoming book. It's the first presentation that Mark does, so we're very privileged for that, and we'll probably work It'll as... be a disaster. <laughs> You're literally the test audience. Uh, guinea pigs for guinea pigs. that, right? And so today, Mark will present his forthcoming book on inflation, where he questions our common knowledge, <coughs> common sense knowledge on the topic. But obviously, I'll leave that to Mark. But before giving the, the floor to Mark, I want to thank, and thank him in the name of the organiz organizing team for having accepted our invitation to be here with us today to deliver this open lecture on inflation. Uh, Anna, Paolo, and I, and also a big thanks to Paolo and Anna for organizing this uh, all together. It was great. We also want to thank to the people and institutions that in one way or another participated in organizing and supporting this event. First of all, Dinamia Set, and especially Beatriz Curado, Maria José Rodrigues, Bruno Vasconcelos, and Madalena Ferreira. The Youth and Employment, uh, and employment, no, employment <laughs> sorry, Paulo, Youth Employment Observatory, uh, and the School of Social and Human Sciences through the support of the PhD in Political Economy, the Masters in Political Economy, and the Masters in Enterprise and Labor Law. And so now I'll shut up, and uh, you don't have to hear to me. We'll listen to Mark telling um, uh, this um, lecture on inflation. And so Mark, thanks you once again, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you all for showing up on a beautiful day at 5 p.m. where you could all be doing something else. So I really appreciate it. Uh, this is the first time I've tried to talk the book. We, I wrote with the co-author, Niccolo Fraccaroli, who's an economist at the World Bank, who used to be my postdoc. I'll show you a picture of him in a moment, and any soccer fans here are going to get some points if you can tell me who this guy is the doppelganger of, because I'm convinced he's the doppelganger. But anyway, um, we started to write this book, and at first we were, were I'll, I'll get into the story as to why we were doing it very shortly, but what it's ended up as being, if you have read austerity, this is kind of austerity for inflation. We didn't really mean to do that, it just ended up being this way, because we had a hunch, so I'll start talking about the hunch. So here, who's that guy the double of if you're a soccer fan? <laughs> 
Diogo Giotto. Isn't he? Every time he walked into my office, I was like, you're he's like, no, absolutely not. He's not buying it at all. I think he looks like Diogo Giotto. All right, so Nick wrote with uh, Skidelsky back at the same time as writing the austerity book. And they did a book called Austerity versus Stimulus. And he was writing at the same time I was. We became communicators, then collaborators, then he became my postdoc. And when the whole inflation thing kicked in sort of shortly after COVID, he came into my office one day and said, we should do a book on this. And I said, well, why? I mean, isn't this kind of, kind of well understood, right? Uh, it turns out contra MMT economies do have capacity limits. And if you shove tons of money through them, you will end up with inflation. And what now happens is that you get a deflationary process, which is either going to be extremely painful and ugly or sort of slightly less painful and ugly. And as usual, everybody who's got the least will pay the most for it. And he said, exactly. This is monetary austerity. And I was like, oh, shit. You're right, this is kind of similar. And the interesting thing about inflation is it gets a free pass, right? Because somehow, when you see austerity, you say to people, you know, you immediately like, you're gonna be cutting government budgets. That means that those who rely on government expenditure are the most affected. When you say inflation, there's this kind of idea that everyone suffers from inflation. And it's a kind of public good to get rid of inflation. But if you're a political economist, you immediately go, mm -mm, that does not smell right, because what my assets are will determine how inflation affects me, how, how I consume, where I am in the income distribution. All of these things are going to be incredibly important to what your own personal experience of inflation is. So we started to look into this with this idea, is inflation fighting really just monetary austerity? And we very quickly came up with this little toy typology, if you will, of the winners from inflation, because of course there are winners, I'll talk a bit about that. The losers from inflation, who sometimes are obvious and are sometimes less obvious. The users of inflation, those who basically get to uh, advantage themselves or at least protect themselves from inflation, which is what we kind of usually think of as firms as doing, right? But then, of course, there are people who are literally the abusers of inflation who really get to make out like bandits on this. Banks' net interest income is a fantastic example of this. So that was, that was the orientation, and we decided to go from there. So the first one is, well, what is inflation? And of course, you have to bring in Maggie, and you have to bring in Milton Friedman. So Milton Friedman, of course, said, inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon in the sense that it is and can be produced only by a more rapid increase in the quantity of money than in output. So it's a causal statement, right? Increase M, you're going to get inflation if basically output is constant. That has to happen. That's the core claim. And that's sort of the dominant understanding of inflation. Now, here's a poster that hangs in the research office of the Federal Reserve Building in Washington, D.C. Shootings are always and everywhere a ballistic phenomena. Right? That is not a causal statement. There is no causal statement in there because you know that bullets are involved, but it doesn't tell you anything about who shot someone and why. And the point of them putting this up there is you might think money is your first causal vector, but it's true that bullets kill people, but that doesn't really give you that much information. There's a more neutral way of thinking about this just in terms of what this thing is, and this is Mrs. Thatcher's favorite line. Inflation is a sustained rise in the general level of all prices. It is not houses getting more expensive, right? It is not Bitcoin going on a tear. It is all prices all rising together. So this is just a sort of like state space description. Totally fine, that's what it is. We can agree on that one, right? This one is the one that informs policy, and this is the one that's actually the most interesting. So that's our orientation. Let's go through it. So I love this cartoon here, right? We've checked all our nets and concluded there are no fish smaller than this. The instrument you see, you use affects what you see. So the first chapter of the book, we decided to actually go figure out how people measure inflation. And you'd think this would be a boring topic, and maybe for some people it is, but it's actually kind of fascinating. So when you look at the way that the Fed calculates, for example, their consumption expenditure index, or you look at the Bank of England and you look at the ECB, what you begin to find out is not only are they putting these things together in very different ways, they're actually counting very different things. They also weight things in very different ways. New Zealand, I'll talk about in a minute, put housing in their index in 2021. Most central banks don't put housing. I'm looking at people in this room, you're probably like, what? Because that's what I spend half my money on, right? So why is that not in there? And actually the short answer, which I'll get to, is because you don't eat houses. Because we look at items that you consume. 
well, but I still spend my money on it. Well, how should I think about this? So once you start to get in the process of index construction, it really opens up the whole thing because you're measuring different things. You're including different things. The Fed, for example, has a survey that looks at 44,000 different items every month. The Bank of England has about 8,500. The ECB has an entirely different way of calculating this. So are we even measuring the same things? So when you start to look at the press, and the press says, Germany's inflation is this high, and England's inflation, mm, 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 right? Second thing, we hear about headline and core, right? So economists love to take out headline inflation and say, oh, that's too volatile. What we need to do is look at core. Well, what does core strip out? Depending on which index you're looking at, seasonal items, right? But mostly food and housing. So the two things that are the things that most people care about that are the biggest part of your budget get taken out of the index. Seems a bit weird, doesn't it? Now, I'm not imputing any motives here. I'm not saying that's to make the numbers lower or massage them or whatever, but that's actually what we do. Now, there's good reasons for doing this because you want to look at the general level of all prices. But again, think about this from the point of view of individual consumption. Right? That is the vast majority of people's expenditures, food and housing. If you throw fuel in when you have a big supply shock to fuel, as we've just had, you're kind of taking out of the index most of the stuff that people find important. Kind of weird. Third one, we've had what we call the experience problem. The inflation that you experience is very different from the inflation that I experience. Isabella Weber, the economist, told me this wonderful story that sums this up beautifully. Her mom grew up in a small village in southern Germany, or she grew up with her mom, and she's a single mom, and she had a neighbor who was much better off because her husband had died and left her a ton of cash. So in the village, everybody's more or less equal, apart from whether you own your house or not, that's pretty much it. So there's an inflation. Now imagine what happens to these two baskets, literally baskets of consumption, right? Her mom, single mom, fixed budget, inflation goes up, everything gets more expensive, your real purchasing power goes down. It's a very simple story. Her friend, her friend liked to buy champagne, but it was too expensive, so she would buy sect, the bubbly stuff that's cheap. Now, it just happens that because of the pandemic, there was an overabundance of champagne on the market. So champagne fell in price, even as indexes went up. At the same time, because her basket is constrained, she doesn't buy any strawberries, which meant that there was a glut on the market on strawberries. So the price of strawberries went down. So the two things that she wasn't able to afford, she still can't afford, but they just got cheaper for her friend, who has more money to start with. So even within very, very similar consumption baskets, you can get massively different effects in terms of what's actually consumed. So when you start talking about averages and index outputs, these things sound very precise, but they're actually very loosey-goosey. Right? There's a whole bunch of stuff in here. It's a classic example of you don't want to see how sausages are made. And there's a lot of sausage being made here in various different ways. And the bottom line that we come to is that your consumption and mine and everyone else's is very, very different. So what you personally experience as inflation is actually very different from that index number and what it's meant to be. Now, why go through this whole exercise? We go through this whole exercise to basically bring home that if that is the case, that if it's your wealth, your assets, your income, etc., that really determine your experience of inflation, right there, prima facie evidence, you cannot possibly tell me that everyone suffers. You can't tell me that we, even if we suffer, we suffer in the same way. So there has to be a distributional story here. So let's try and think about the distributional story. The last one, as I mentioned, housing. We do a whole thing on housing in this chapter, just to show that what happened was in New Zealand, they finally, because the prices were going through the roof and it was a huge part of everyone's uh, expenditure, the, the government told the central bank in 2019 to put housing in the, uh, the calculation of inflation. And the Reserve Bank of New Zealand said, all right, so they did. And then nothing changed in the index. I don't know why either. And I went through the math. I couldn't figure it out. So, <coughs> a bit of history on this. Why do we do what we do? Why do we do what we do when we have inflation? And this is the classic thing about if you only have a hammer. So, what's the hammer? It's raising interest rates, right? That's the one thing. Doesn't matter what you think's causing it. The one policy response. You turn to the central bank and you say, "Could you please raise interest rates?" So, what we started to unpack in here is this notion, and this goes back to the austerity story of, you may remember the austerity story was, oh, we have all this debt. Well, yes, because you're bailing out your banks. Shh, okay, but we have all this debt. Now we need to pay it back. But I didn't generate any of the debt. Shh, we need to pay it back, right? And we're going to have a recession. It's going to be bad, but don't worry, it'll be really short, 
and after that it'll be fine and we'll all be better off, right? It's the same story. We have to have a recession, why? Because there's too much inflation, okay. And how does this work? Well, basically you increase the cost of borrowing, businesses go bankrupt, people become unemployed, consumption drops, and then basically prices fall back to the equilibrium trend. And you're like, well, that's rather brutalist. Yes, but it's a necessary recession. Now, it's also based off of a kind of a Phillips curve logic, which we'll get into in a little bit, but that's the basic idea behind it. And the thing is, you know, why did we ever think like this? If you go back to the 50s or 60s, up to the 70s, we never thought this way, right? The central banks are so important these days, independent central banks doing their stuff, right? Uh, they used to be the check cashing agency for the national treasury. They took orders from the politicians. They told them what the interest rate would be. They wrote credit policies, all this sort of stuff that was no long, we no longer do. And why was this? Well, because the story of the 70s, which is something we unpack in different stages of the book, is that we call it the 70s show Act 1. Basically, that whole system got out of control. It generated inflation. There was too much inflation everywhere. It was because there was too much money being printed. It was very much the Friedman type explanation. And along came this guy called Paul Volcker and he became the head of the Fed. And because he was independent, he finally used the independence of the Fed and he jacked up interest rates to like 16% real, 20% nominal, and that caused a huge crushing of the American economy, bankrupted loads of businesses, unemployment shot up, it was awful. But then what happened is inflation absolutely collapsed at that point. And then after that, as Ronald Reagan said when he was re-elected re -elected in 1984, it's morning in America and the, the economy took off. Now, immediately you should go, this doesn't smell right, because what happened at that period was the entire banking sector was deregulated. And what that meant was credit that was very hard to come by under the old system suddenly became very available at a price. So imagine that you've got 20% nominal inflation, you've got a real rate of 16 Right? And you're in, uh, of, of interest rates, and, you're in, and your inflation rate's about 15, 14%. Once you crush the economy, you will absolutely bring down inflation. There's simply less economic activity. But imagine it settles at about 6%. But you've deregulated your banks, and they're now able to charge 12% interest. Oh, I just made 6% real just for showing up. Would anyone like a credit card? So this is the beginnings of that whole sort of tsunami of credit that basically financializes Western economies. So it's not just a question of this guy was a hero who stood up to the politicians and did this terrible thing for the greater good. Loads of people benefited from it. Mortgages were more available, credit was more available. Banking became fantastically profitable. As Volcker was quoted for at the time at a congressional hearing, Dick Gephardt, who was a senator from, Minis I think, Minnesota at the time, which was very much hit by the industrial closures that had been caused by this recession, he said, my constituents are furious at what you're doing. And Volcker shot back and said, my constituents are happy. Who are the constituents of the central bank? The other banks. So, you know, right there, there's the distributional politics written into this. Then we go into like, okay, so let's say they even worked on its own terms. Let's accept this as the valid story of the 1970s, right? What else happens? Well, one of the consequences of this was the way the American banking sector was structured, mortgages were generated by these very small credit institutions called savings and loans. And they were like building societies in the United Kingdom, savings sparkasse in, in Germany, right? People put in deposits. They had very little leverage. You lent it back out to someone. That became a mortgage. The income stream from that then valorizes the deposit. You do more lending. Very, very simple. When you have high interest rates in the deregulated banking sector, these guys are instantly uncompetitive. So the only way that they could make money was to increase the leverage. That is to basically borrow more money relative to what they're lending out to increase the profitability. And they did this, but none of them had balance sheets that could support this. They were all interlinked, and the whole thing blew up in a collapse in 1985. So there was a right away, there was a massive financial cost that led to basically as equivalent to a trillion dollar bailout that everyone's forgotten. So that's the first bailout of finance as early as 1985. Second one, Latin America, right? So uh, irony of history, right? I'm the Rhodes Professor of International Economics. That's named after a guy called William Rhodes. William Rhodes worked for a guy called Walter Riston. Walter Riston ran Citibank. Citibank was the people who took all of the dollars from Saudi Arabia after the oil price hikes, petrodollars, and then said, what are we going to do with these? Because if we put them back in the American economy, this is going to be massively inflationary. And they basically said, I don't know, let's give them to Latin America. Countries never go bust. 
That's literally Walter Riston's line. So he channels all this money into Latin America at a time when the, the real interest rate on the loan is negative because inflation hasn't shot up yet and you're getting it basically at a negative real rate from the Saudis because they just want to get it out of the country. So Brazil, Argentina, everybody loads up on these loans. Mexico, what happens when Volcker jocks interest rates 16%? Mexico gets on the phone and says, we're doomed. You're not getting your money back. And the problem is they'd lent so much money that if they didn't get the money back, Citibank was going down. So my guy was the guy who went around Latin America getting everyone together to put the debt repayments together, which resulted in the lost decade of Argentinian growth and endemic hyperinflation in places like Argentina. So knock yourself out, great. So it seems that there's a few more things go on here than we're willing to pay attention to. Last one, long-term growth. Whenever you have interest rate shocks, there's an assumption that there's a long-term rate of growth. You get an interest rate shock, it goes down and it goes back at the trend rate of growth. No, just go look at the serious work on this. What actually happens is a process called hysteresis, whereby your long-term rate of growth collapses and never comes back up. So basically, for every one point of benefit that you get from deflationary processes, you get six points of harm. So just think about that in terms of the damage that you're doing to your own long-term growth path by these deflationary processes. So another interesting twist on this was a whole bunch of people at the beginning of this, the, the debate over inflation, shall we say, started to say, this isn't the 1970s, this is wrong. Because they're still working with this idea the 70s is all about freedmen and money and stuff like that. It's the 1940s, it's the Korean War, we've got a couple of supply shocks, suddenly we don't have enough steel, steel's really expensive, at that time it's a huge part of the economy, that filters out into other things. So basically what we need to do is price controls. Now, if you say price controls in a room of economists and you're not heavily armed, you could be killed, <laughs> right? And there's a young economist called Isabella Weber who wrote a piece for the Guardian newspaper and on, she was just defenestrated on Twitter, right? And what happened was, and part of the reason I got into doing this book was I know Isabella and she wrote, reached out to me and said, how do you, ha via Adam Tooze, and said, how do you handle a Twitter mob? And I was like, oh, you've come to the right place. So we sort of diffused that a little bit. And in fact, I tried to get the Twitter data and do a paper on it, but Elon had bought the company and he locked it all up for eight months. And then he wanted $48,000 for the data I was like, son of a bitch. Anyway, right, so couldn't do that paper. But nonetheless, she does this public intervention, which is, well, why don't we use price controls? I mean, if, if it's so damaging to do interest rates, if there's no real long-term benefit, if it has these distributional asymmetries, like, why not just do this, right? So that we call this the policy that dare not speak its name, right? We're not allowed to talk about that. And we'll talk about why we're not allowed to talk about that. Now, let's go back and do why we can't talk about it, the official version, right? This is Act Two of the 1970s. So Act One is Volcker's the hero, right? Jack's up, right? Act Two is Nixon's failure. So what happens was in the United States, the way that they used to do it when they had dependent central banks was you had prices and incomes policies. And this was very common across the world. You, if you're targeting full employment, you don't want to jack up interest rates because what you'll do is you'll make employment a control variable rather than a target. And that would be kind of stupid if you're trying to maximize the control variable. So what we used to do was get unions and employers and government together in various forms of tripartism and bargain over wages, et cetera, and have guideposts, et cetera. Now, for various reasons that we'll go into shortly, that in the United States begins to really fall apart in the 1960s. So you need to do, uh, there's a need to do a new way to do this. And the way that they did was to impose price controls. Now, the story of the Nixon's price control, the official history, as we call it, goes like this. Uh, they made mandatory price controls. Now, first of all, this is America. We don't do socialism, we don't do big government, and you don't do price controls in peacetime. You just don't get away with that. So here's a Republican controlling the price of pork. No, nah, not good optics. Uh, so it's, that, that's just bad, right? But he does it, and it kind of works. That's the thing about it, right? The core rate, whoo, all the way down. And then what happens is they go to a sort of like slightly looser regime and anyway, that's not important. Price controls don't work because what happens is ultimately they fail, they're abandoned, and then the prices go up. And that's kind of the official response. You go look in the textbooks, this is the story. We'll get into why that's actually not what happened, but price controls were seen to have failed in the next administration. This is the precursor as to why Volcker had to do rates. This is the beginnings of there is no alternative, right? Because once that framework of guideposts, prices and incomes policy is seen to fail, your last redoubt, your last hope is price controls. That didn't work either. Next up, Mrs. Thatcher, right? This is the way the logic goes.
So we looked into whether anyone tried controls this time around, and it turned out loads of countries did. It's just that nobody talked about it. So, of course, you did it here. It started off with public transport, and it was energy costs that were controlled. Now, they were hailed as a kind of a success, but we complicate the story by comparing it with what happened in Hungary. Because, of course, Hungary, you have a strong man running the place, so he can just say, we're going to have price controls, and everybody goes, yes, boss, and you have price controls. So Hungary had much stricter price controls, and they totally didn't work. So it can't just be the controls. What is it? Well, it turns out people in Hungary are actually a lot poorer than people in Spain, and that means their consumption baskets are different. So when you try and control things and basically create shortages and the prices go up even if they're controlled, if they're weighted heavily in the inflation index, as they are in Hungary, because they're a bigger part of everyone's consumption, it's going to go up. Now, does that mean that they actually suffered a higher rate of inflation? Or is that a function of weighting and how the index is constructed? Oh, right. Now, the Spanish one was a success, was it? Or was it the way the index is constructed because Spanish people spend proportionately less on things that went up more? So once you start to get into this, where are we now, 20? All right, cool. Uh, once you start, I'm never going to get through this thing. Um, just stop me when I'm boring you. Um, so that didn't work too well, right? Germany, of course, it worked, it worked but probably not for the reasons we thought. Um, Scotland tried to control the price of rents. Without going into too much detail, it was a disaster. And, uh, and then in Germany, they controlled the gas price because that was the thing that we're really worried about, the gas, the gas price brems it, and that one worked out quite well. well. There's loads of hidden controls all over the place, even in supposedly free market Europe. Electricity markets, if you look into this stuff, oh my God. And then you start to talk about other things that get done all the time, like taxes on certain things or tax rebates on other things, subsidies, other types of agreements. It turns out there's a whole panoply of things that not only do we do them all the time and are actually perfectly normal, they're actually very effective inflation controls. But we're told repeatedly there's only one thing you can do. Volcker's hammer, interest rates, recession, that's the way it has to be. So. To get into this more, we basically tell sort of the, the four stories of inflation uh, at, this, at this part in the book. And basically, we're saying this is the politics of blame, right? Because ultimately, if you can identify who or what causes inflation, then you get to say it's your fault. And if it's your fault, you have to pay for it. So if you think about every inflation story is basically winners and losers and attribution, and then who has to pay for it, you end up with four stories that basically become the way that we think about this. So the first one associated with Larry Summers is there was too much money. This is very much the American story. This is the stimulus checks that went out during the pandemic, this sort of stuff. And the basic idea here was back in the day when we had the austerity uh, era, the argument most macroeconomists made who were on the austerity side was that the, the multipliers, how much extra you get from public spending, is actually negative. So if your multiplier is negative, you spend 100, you end up with 90, you've just wasted your money, right? This time, the very same people who were for austerity were basically for raising interest rates. What a surprise. And now all the multipliers are positive. So you're like, oh, so what will happen is if you spend 100 on stimulus, you'll end up with 120 in spending, and it's too inflationary given our capacity constraints, right? So this is the argument. That plus the pandemic shuts down supply chains. Basically, the supply curve moves in, the demand curve moves up, boom, you end up with inflation, right? So in the book, what I did was I went to a thing called uh, the uh, Survey of Consumer Finances from the New York Fed. And it actually shows what people spent the, st the stimulus checks on. So it's quite fascinating. The biggest ever credit card receivables in history was, surprise, surprise, three months after they got the checks. So by my calculations, over 25% of stimulus checks went straight on a credit card reduction, which is by definition non-stimulatory. The next set of checks, it was back rent. So what people actually spent it on was literally groceries, food, and paying down their credit cards so they didn't go bust, none of which is actually stimulatory. Second one, obviously, the whole notion of too much money, well, it depends where you are in the income distribution. right? You're going to spend that stimulus check if you need it. If you don't need it, you're going to save it. So much so that we ended up with this phenomenon that I call Schrodinger's checks. Because these things were meant to have been spent in 2021 and 22 to cause inflation. But in 2023 and 24, you were getting stories in the financial press about how all these savings, these excess savings, were keeping the economy going. Well, you're like, you can't have it spent in one period and saved in the next. That's literally quantum physics, right? This doesn't make any sense. So we point out why this probably is not a robust story. Then, classic Phillips curve, right? 
There, the problem is too much employment. Now, sounds a bit weird, but bear with me. This is basically the story. For those of you who have never seen a Phillips curve, essentially, it's a guy called Phillips who was a New Zealander, and he basically plotted this curve. This is actually the Americans who did it to themselves afterwards. And basically, what it says is, here's your unemployment rate, and it tends to be, if you've got higher unemployment, you've got lower inflation. And in fact, you can kind of map it out a long curve over time. The original work was Britain from like 1870-something all the way through to the 1940s. And it seems to imply a trade-off, right? You can have lower unemployment if you're willing to tolerate higher inflation, and that gives you a menu for policy, right? The thing is, this isn't true. It fell apart in the 70s. Mathematically, it makes no sense, blah, blah, blah. But guess what? It still informs how we think about inflation. Because if you think about it, what we're basically saying is here, right? We've got too much inflation. If we want to get inflation down, what do we need? We need more unemployment. So there's a Phillips curve logic embedded into the policy regime, even if most modern macro wouldn't go anywhere near an actual Phillips curve. So it's kind of weird. Anyway, um, what does this lead to? This is the whole thing about wage price spirals. This is the idea that essentially when you've got tight labor markets, which you do during and after the pandemic, uh, we no longer like immigration in many countries. We've got uh, lots of baby boomers who are retiring. You've got super tight labor markets. You've got a lot of demand in those labor markets. It means that people are going to be able to bid up wages. And if they bid up wages, what has to move? Well, the only other variable is prices. So then what you get is this competition between prices and wages where they move each other up and up and up. And that's basically the, the, the too much employment story. And you see this very much in the ECB pronouncements in 21, 22, beginning in 23, they move away from this. This was very much Olivier Blanchard on every Twitter thing he did for like two years. Was, well, watch wages, watch wages. And it turns out wages actually didn't grow as much as inflation. The whole notion that people were able to recoup the lost value that they got from the inflationary loss simply didn't happen pretty much everyone's down outside the top 10% of the income distribution. And that's because they didn't get more wages. It's because they have more wealth to start with, so it's actually less important, right? So the key thing we get into here is the whole notion here about expectations, right? What is it that, how does this actually work? Can workers really drive these spirals? And for those of you who are interested in the economics of this, we go into quite, in quite detail. Uh, essentially, there's very little evidence that these types of inflationary expectations really exist in the public. There's very little empirical evidence that you can actually find them. Usually what they are is like the bit of the coefficient that you can't explain from everything else that's in the long equation. That's kind of, if that's it, that's expectations, right? And they're more of a kind of a, like a placeholder fairy story than they are actually any type of real scientific concept. The main one being is that the thing that, that this is driven from that, and that doesn't exist. So if that doesn't exist, you can't really tell that story. That's kind of where it is, but we do it anyway. Um, then we get to the Paul Krugman story, which is this one. It's the supply side. So really, it's just pandemic and war equals higher prices. This is the 1940s. This is the Korean War, etc. This is where we go. And the weird thing about this one is this is also an expectations argument. But this time, they say, and this is really cute, that, well, the reason it's not going to spiral is because the public knows that this is really just a short-term thing. So they'll see through it, and it won't actually affect the long-term expectations. Well, our point is, like, if they don't actually have these expectations, why would you go down that alley anyway? It doesn't seem to make much sense. It, the simple story, it's a giant supply shock and it will dissipate, simple. But the fact that you have to smuggle in an expectation story into this is just very strange. Uh, and again, do people really think this way about prices? And the answer is no. And then Isabella Weber, right, from her Time 100 Influential People cover shot. So if you ever get murdered in The Guardian by a bunch of economists, you can end up in Time magazine. So that's a pretty good payoff. Uh, so of course, she just points out the one thing that everyone actually knows is true because you go to the supermarket. Maybe there are firms that are going to take advantage of this stuff, right? So she calls it seller's inflation, which I like to call, well, you would if you could, wouldn't you? So if you're sitting in the supermarket or you're walking into the supermarket and you go to the cereal, cereal aisle, you know, you've seen it, the box is this size and it's still half full. So it's just no longer the same thing. The candy bar has gone like this, right? I mean, everything is more expensive. Well, two things, right? First of all, are they actually making more profits? And this is something we get into later because there's a difference between profits and markup. And it's actually really important. Because imagine a firm that basically all its input costs double, and it used to make 20%. If it then it doubles its sales price, it's still making 20%. Notional profit has doubled, but it's actually the same from where they started proportionately. So what really has to move is the margins, right? That's what has to go. So do you actually see that? To do that, you really need to have good data on input costs. 
and be able to calculate that, and it's really hard to get intermediate firm input cost data. To the extent that you can get this, what it does show is that they did do it. And in fact, the ECB at the end of 2023 said 40% of all the inflation the EU experienced over the past 12 months has basically been this. So it really was gas prices and then firms not necessarily price gouging, but protecting their margins, and in highly concentrated markets, actually pressing on and making excess profits. Best example of what, how much we got? Uh, we're on 30. Jesus Christ, I'm, not, I'm nowhere near this. See, it's the first time I've talked the book, so I'm so sorry. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip through, but skip through a lot. Um, anyway, this is the, the last of the... Hang on, I think it's the last of these ones. Uh, so basically, you know, is it price gouging or not? There are real limits to how much you can do this sort of stuff. So that's the four main genres we get into. Uh, it depends what you want to talk about. The next thing we do is hyperinflation. We have time. Okay. I know, but I hate boring people. I'm like, I'm, after 40 minutes, like, you know, my brain goes numb, my ass goes numb. I mean, I'm sort of, you know, do you, do you want me to so I just, I mean, really? All right, all right. I'll try and get through it faster. Turns out there's a, turns out there's a lot in the book. Um, so basically, we do hyperinflation, and the story on hyperinflation is, you know, how do you get there? Um, the two people who set the agenda on this, a guy called Kagan back in the 50s, and Koletsky, who you might know for other reasons. And Kagan basically says it's 50% a month or more increase in prices. Koletsky's is actually much more useful, which is basically uh, an aggravated tendency for any population to substitute their currency for anybody else's currency which is actually a far better way of thinking about it, right? Because ultimately, what is inflation that most people face, particularly in hyperinflation conditions? You don't want to hold the government's money. You don't trust it. You don't think it has any value. And now, one, on the one hand, that sounds like a really sort of monetary story, right? It's the central bank that are printing all this money, right? But I'll show you how confusing this is. You've probably seen this picture before at some point. If you do Google Images, hyperinflation always shows up. And this is the guy with the wheelbarrow in Germany moving around marks because they were worthless, right? A little bit of correction on that. He works in the central bank. That's why he's got a wheelbarrow full of money. No evidence of hyperinflation, just a lot of money. So, you know, a little footnote on that one. Anyway, the point that we make is, uh, with all this stuff is that, yes, money's involved in this, but it's the ballistic story. You don't know whether it's causal or not. And usually in hyperinflation, what you've got is a problem with exchange rates. Right? Very simply, pretty much all cases of hyperinflation are small, vulnerable open economies that have a soft currency. It's not regarded as a savings asset. So that means that a current account constraint has to operate. If you're going to import stuff, and usually these are commodity dependent or similar sort of export oriented economies, then they're going to have to balance their imports with their exports over time. And if they don't do that, then the people who are selling them the imports are highly likely to either demand more of the domestic currency or alternatively payment in a hard currency that they can't print. That is where all the trouble starts. It's really through the exchange rate. And what happens is when you can't manage that, when it goes from this to this, that's when the central bank kicks in and starts printing money. It's an emergency measure. It's a symptom of failure rather than a cause. So basically what we do is we go through the Venezuela example. These are handicrafts made out of Venezuela currency. So, so you know, we go through the story, Bolivarian missions, the distributional politics of the revolution, etc. how essentially the economy had one thing, which was oil. Oil price collapses at the same time they start to do mass cronyism in terms of who gets jobs in the regime. Once that happens, inflation, once that happens, basically the skills to run the oil industry start to dissipate. When that goes at a time of low oil prices, they don't put more investment into it. You get into this death spiral on that. That's 20% of your exports. 20% of GDP in a larger 60% of your exports. So you're just dead through oil dependence. Uh, you sweat the oil asset, and eventually you get that exchange rate problem. You try and manage it in very, various ways, but ultimately you get economic collapse and mass migration. The, the point being, it's not about the central bank printing money. It's the fact that you're ludicrously dependent on one commodity and its price just collapsed. At the same time, you're engaging in mass redistribution for the first time in the history of the country. Uh, Zimbabwe, there's the $100 $100 billion actually exists, right? You know you've you got problems. Well, why is this? Well, because you have a post-colonial regime, post-colonial post settler regime, whereby you had incredibly concentrated land holdings. After the settlement in 1980, you try and redistribute land, but you do it in such a way that you do redistribute in micro parcels. This is a really interesting effect because it's no longer big enough to be collateral for the financial system, so the banks won't lend against it. And the folks who are inheriting it don't really have the skills to run it at any bigger scale, so you get this huge mismatch. 
And then basically, your exports start to collapse because guess what? You're an agricultural exporter. The government steps in, starts to do export credits, which is subsidies paid for by the central bank. Then all the war veterans from the War of Liberation, they want their pensions. You can't pay them off, so then you do a diversionary war with a neighbor. Then you end with mass political cronyism, and then you ask yourself, is this fiscal incontinence or a broken state? And it's a broken state. And the good comparative for this case, actually, I don't say there, but also works for Argentina, is why are the East Asian states able to do this in a way that neither Latin American nor African states were able to do it? And the short answer is that basically in Latin America and also in Africa, the working classes, qua the ex-military guerrillas, et cetera, et cetera, they were incorporated into the settlement at the beginning. You couldn't squeeze them for resources. Whereas the East Asians basically were able to squeeze labor and have huge domestic savings rates. That funds your capital. If you don't have that, you're either bringing under printing presses, the Zimbabwe case, or you're importing it, which is the Argentine constraint. So Argentina, we do this one as well, blah, blah, blah. You know the story, don't need to go through it. Basically, you know, why Argentina could not be East Asia, uh, the Peronist Labour Coalition meant that you couldn't squeeze labour right from the beginning. And then when you get to the 1970s, you get a supply series of supply shocks, particularly in oil, that are really damaging the country. At the same time, you borrowed absolutely tons of dollars. Guess what happens? Your exchange rate collapses. You start to get inflation through your import channel. The central bank moves to accommodate, and it just goes endemic, and it's really hard to get rid of it once you do that. Uh, and then Weimar Germany, uh, which basically I did an austerity, so I don't really need to go through that now. Basically, it was really about not paying reparations to the French. Simple way to think about it is if you got up every morning and 40 cents of every dollar that you made went straight to the French treasury so that they didn't have to work, you wouldn't want to do it either. So what did they do? They crashed the economy because they basically had to pay back in gold marks. How do you pay back in gold marks? You have a strong exchange rate. Well, you occupy the czar land. We'll pay everybody's wages. We'll literally run the printing presses. Our exchange rate will collapse. Our ability to pay back reparations goes to zero. The Americans who've been investing us since the end of the war want their money back. They're going to come in with a bailout, which they did. It was called the Dawes Plan. And from 24 to 29, that was the whole, uh, it's cabaret time, boom time in Germany, razzmatazz, jazz, the whole lot. Tons of money flowing in. 1929, Wall Street goes nuts. The Federal Reserve puts interest rates up to 7%. All the money leaves Germany. Brunning comes in, slashes the budget, and that's how you get Hitler. It's nothing to do with the hyperinflation. It happens almost a decade later. So the story that you hear all the time about, oh, the hyperinflation brought Hitler to power, total bullshit. It's 10 years off. All right, my God. So the take home on all this, there's no necessary pathway from mild inflation to hyperinflation. It's not coming to a country like yours anytime soon. Let me kit to the end. I'm not going to do this, but let's go here. All right, so here's the last bit. Our inflation wars, class wars, the winners, losers, and abusers of inflation. So there's a percentage change in average profit markup major corporations, 20 to 22. Have a look at the oil companies. That's not really a shock, is it? 45% shift. Energy companies, oh, McDonald's, Subways. Why can you do that? Because you're basically monopolies, right? So you can do this one. What have we got here? CVS Health. Healthcare doesn't go up, it's kind of interesting. Tesla, GM, Ford, um, whoa, interesting. Loads of big companies. What is this all about? Well, concentrated markets where you've basically got pricing power. So the way that the auto industry did this in America was just brilliant. The auto industry used to work in the following mo model. If you wanted to buy a car in the United States, you waited till August. Because they did their year end, which was August. End of summer, we're going to bring in our new stuff in the fall. We'll really start promoting it by Christmas. We'll have our Christmas sales. We'll do the bulk of our sales through there, and then we have the summer clear out. So they would make far too many cars. They'd all pile up on these dealers' lots, and you'd get them in huge discounts. So they were doing a volume model rather than a high margin model. Then what happened was the pandemic. And remember the whole thing about they didn't have enough chips to finish the cars? It's totally true, right? So suddenly you had a shortage of cars. And what they figured out was that people were willing to pay anything for a car because the United States is a totally car dependent place. So irrespective of where you are on the income distribution, oh, we just figured out a whole new business model. We're going to make less cars and charge you loads more for them. That's exactly what you're seeing there. Right? So yes, absolutely, there were firms that took advantage of this. They're going to different things called the income effect, the Fisher effect, the consumption effect. Basically, the income effect is uh, how much you benefit from having debt through inflation. Uh, the Fisher, oh, no, income effect, the Fisher channel is the debt one, the consumption effect. Um, the basic story that we tell is one of workers versus firms that uh, 
really when you think about this, you don't have to go for that wage price spiral model, which is more than a bit dodgy. But essentially, when you've got an inflationary process, it is a question of who's going to take the hit for it. And so there's an essential truth about the 1970s, which was it really was a conflict, if you will, between labor and capital, which is a, a reasonable way to look at it. Was this still the same? Yeah, but the difference is that we don't have unions anymore. You don't have organization, you don't have national economies, you can't strike credibly, you can just move production. So essentially when you have an inflationary process, rather than it working out as sort of like a bargaining situation between labor and capital at the domestic level, I've got international exit, I don't care about this stuff, I'm out of here, I can invest in lots of different things. So essentially labor is the one that gets residualized and then you get this, you're able to basically push on in your margins. Um, we basically checked whether there really was catch up in wages, and in fact, there wasn't. There were, we call them wage price laggards. And, you know, are firms really inflation's clear winners? In some cases, they are. My favorite example of this in the book is the Saudi Premier League, right? If anybody watches that nonsense, right? So, how much is Ronaldo getting paid? Like billions, right? So, and also Neymar, who'll probably never kick a ball again, I think, is getting paid more than like France spends on social security, right? Now, where did they get all that money? They got all that money from the price shock on oil. I mean, they literally have more money than God. So what are you going to do? Why don't we have a professional soccer league in the middle of Saudi Arabia? All right, I guess you can, because that's how much money you've got. So yes, there were certainly people who were making clear winners out of this. But to go back up to the markups thing, even with firms, it's actually not that clear this is true across the board. It tends to be true for firms in highly concentrated markets that have got real pricing power. That tends to be, in most economies, more markets than you think. Think about things like supermarkets, three or four, right? Think about your internet providers in any city. You're lucky if you've got a choice of one or two, right? So what's happened to many economies, Thomas Philippon and others have written about this, is that they've just become much more concentrated over time. And whenever you have that type of structure, you can really push your margins. It's not just protecting your profits. And the biggest one for doing this, basically, is banks. So the great example, they always win, right? But the best example of this is interest rates go up, so basically their net interest margin increases, but you have a thing called a savings deposit. Did anyone notice their savings deposit going up? No, not really. So there's a thing called the pass-through. You can calculate how much of the interest in income goes back to deposits, and it's really bad. I mean, like 12%, 10%, 8% increases right across the whole of the European space. Nobody got paid off. The banks basically took this as profits. Now, can they continue to do this forever? No. Ultimately, what happens is Apple comes along with a, with a card, and the card gives you 4.5%. So why would I sit there with my money earning nothing at a deposit account? So there's a time limit on this and how much you can do it. The second thing is it also stems from a huge confusion about what banks are which is banks don't need deposits to make loans. They need deposits to get a banking license and insurance. They actually just borrow money overnight and then lend it out for various periods and renew the credit through repo markets. So the whole model of fractional reserve banking is something you read in the textbook. It doesn't exist anywhere outside of terribly small countries with very, very poor capital markets. So the whole model is kind of bullshit. What that means is that banks can do loads of things to enrich themselves short term with inflation. Now, take home on all this, are inflation wars class wars? And what we say is, well, they are, but they don't really have to be. Because ultimately, there's loads of things you can do other than interest rates, explosions, etc., cetera, uh, to, to basically tame inflation. Uh, it's a shame I didn't go through that. See, there's part three of Volcker, but I just skipped through that because I didn't want to go for so long. All right, last bit of the book, basically, does this mean more inflation or less inflation in the future? So we map out two possible futures. Uh, this is a Volkswagen Golf GTI from 1978. It's amazing the pictures you can find on the internet. Um, when this came out, it cost uh, just under 10,000 US dollars. If you scale that to today's dollars, uh, then that would cost around 45,000. The base model actually costs around 34,000 and is infinitely better. It has all the tech, it's got air conditioning, it's got better engines, it's got better fuel. Line. So in a sense, when you look at things like cars, what you see is the trend for capital is deflation because you have more competition, you have different cars, you're in competition, it all pushes down on prices, you expand the scale of the market, blah, 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 that works. And what you end up with is cheaper stuff over time. So that's a deflationary tendency. Uh, the big one is, is climate change, which you're already beginning to see the effects of, particularly in food. So once you recognize the fragility of food webs and you recognize how they can be shocked by continually rising temperatures, then there's already a work out there that basically says it's already there, it's already baked in, if you pardon the pun, that essentially climate change is going to be a source of inflation going further. To which you can also add demography, 
the old people don't work and we don't have enough young people. We don't like, in, uh, you don't like uh, having immigrants anymore doing stuff, at least in some countries. So what does that mean? It means, well, domestic workers should have higher wages. Right, but unless you are productive enough to pay for those wages, it's got to show up in higher prices, particularly if you're highly import dependent. So there's reasons why you would expect more inflation going forward. So it's just a question of which of these two forces push in which direction going forward. So I spoke for more than I ever intended to. Clearly, thank you very much. I need to actually work the hell out of this talk because clearly that's not going to work. But it's the first time I've talked a book, so I didn't know how to do it. So thank you for being my guinea pigs. Happy to answer any questions you've got. <laughs> There's a simpler story in there, and I know what it is, but I wouldn't have known that unless we'd done this. Well, that was good. It was all right. Yeah. I mean, uh, I, I thought it went well at the beginning, and then I realized it's like, oh, shit, this is going to take about an hour and 20 minutes. This is not good. So we had to skip a bit. Well, I think most people got it, right? <laughs> um, so we'll do questions now. Um, who wants to start? The prosy arabiata, as the Russians say. <laughs> Go on, don't be shy. <laughs> Yay. Should I? I uh, could we do this without the devastating fe levels of feedback? Try it. Let's see if it goes. Let's see what happens. See what happens. Uh, All right, we're hi. good. Hello. Hi, Professor. Uh, thank you for the talk. Um, I'm a Brazilian. I know quite a thing or two about inflation. Not as much as your Argentine neighbors. No, yes. Uh, recently, uh, one of the IMF's directors uh, praised the Brazilian Central Bank for the way we handled, uh, or supposedly are handling inflation. She just forgot to mention that we have the second highest real interest rate. Uh, we are not at war. There's right. no. no reason for that. Um, I have two questions. You spoke about a lot about interests and conflicts. Uh, my thing is, do the orthodoxy has the wrong concept of money? therefore the wrong monetary theory and that's one of the reasons that we always end up uh, fighting inflation the same way mm. does theory besides interests and a lot of people getting rich yeah, yeah. does theory is is theory does does it have any any role to play an in independent it? effect right yes you said you had two questions do you agree with that if orthodoxy right. has the wrong concept of money okay and if so, if that wrong theory is helping us, uh, it, it makes it more difficult to fight inflation. So it depends what you mean by the wrong theory of money. If you mean a charterless theory of money, like an MMT theory of money, then I don't think that actually gets you to a better place. If you mean a theory of money in the sense that it's always and everywhere a monetary phenomena, the Friedman line, then yes, that's absolutely wrong. Right? And the classic example, and we could use Brazil as an example here, right? So why is it that Brazil has such a higher real interest rates? Part of it is a political settlement whereby the domestic bourgeoisie run the banks and basically get to screw everybody else. So that's, that's a political economy variable. It's nothing to do with anything else, right? Um, also, you know, how is credit generated in a credit-constrained economy where basically you don't have a lot of international linkages to bring in domestic credit in, in that sense and through those circuits? So that's going to be part of it. Um, I'll go to Argentina as the, as the other example here. I mean, the fact that Argentina has its own independent currency doesn't mean anything when you've got that much level of foreign debt. And again, when your soya crop booms, your balance of payments goes in, in, in the right direction. When your soya crop fails, you're basically on the road to hyperinflation. That's not something that you're controlling through your central bank. So if you mean by a theory of money like this is the lens, then I absolutely agree with you. I think that is actually very damaging. And part of it, the main part of it for most countries in the world, it's, it's the exchange rate. It's really that. It's that openness in the exchange rate that really causes the problem. Right. It's on. Just pass it over. It's live. Uh, Hello. Hi. Well, thank you for the presentation. It was Really interesting, actually. <laughs> well, my question was related with Argentina because I'm actually pretty interested on the, well, the situation in this country, especially now. I think it's got a yeah. Now they now they've got the monetarist in charge. Kind of saucy, let's say. Yeah. <laughs> for saying in a way, yeah. 
Uh, and I also, uh, it was really interesting when you said, like, in the 70s, like, this shock that happened in, well, Argentina, Brazil. <coughs> and I would like to know how was, like, the relation of this with, the, for example, and, and Menem and the austerity policy in Argentina in that time, blah, 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 that ended in the 2001 crisis. Yeah. And also, I wanted to hear your opinion about, like, the actual situation and this, like, magical solution that right. uh, people like Millet and, well, so, yeah, so let, let's start off with the magical theories, right? If you're part of the protected Peronist coalition, particularly either in the unions or better still in the top 30% of the income distribution as dollar accounts, you don't give a shit. So over time, a pathological regime has taken form that basically ensures enough of the influential people with wealth and assets that they can tolerate high levels of inflation because they don't actually transact in a domestic currency. Everybody else is screwed. And eventually, everyone else went, OK, we need to break this. We're done. Because they're never going to fix it internally. Now, I'm not saying that that's true, but that's what's believed. And in politics, that's what really matters. So once you get to this point, someone like Malay is inevitable. Because it has to, that regime is seen as it must be broken. So that's how you get to that. Now, the interesting thing about Malay, it's a purely monetarist theory, right? Essentially, if we dollarize or we get rid of the central bank, we get rid of the bad people, the bad actors, and then we just go back to textbook economics, we'll be fine, right? Money, first of all. Well, that assumes fractional reserve banking and domestic savings. Good luck with that, right? But the, the vast majority of the problem is the exchange rate and basically supply shocks that just never really dissipated given the structure of the economy. So they're not going to be able to fix it. Now, the interesting thing is there's a way in which Malay can really win from this. And it goes like this. If you get the soy, if you, if you, the projections for the soy harvest for the next three years are really, really good, right? And at the same time, there's that whole gas field that's just about to come online, which basically can make you into a net exporter in two new, well, at least one new sector, and then double down in other ones. And that one, your balance of payment constraint disappears. And if it does, the inflation rate goes down, and everyone says he's a genius. Is he a genius? No. But I can imagine a world in which he will be hailed as one. So th this, this is why I spend a lot of my time thinking about how economic ideas work as things in the world not as technologies to understand the world. And I think this is a particularly good example of that. Et les autres? <laughs> Come on, we talk about anything. Taylor Swift, whatever. <laughs> Whether she really does create macroeconomic boosts. It's kind of interesting, actually. It depends on the size of the city. OK, you open the, ap uh, the appetite. It was, Go on. It was good. Um, there were uh, two aspects that you didn't mention, or at least didn't elaborate, and I would like you to, to go on that. The first one is, uh, where are the states? Where are the, uh, the impacts on the states? Because, of course, I mean, in, in the Portuguese case, uh, we benefited a lot from, uh, from inflation. Yeah. Um, but I didn't see you mentioning this. I suppose that you. you it's in one of the, it's the yeah. winners, but yeah, yeah, we don't really go into it in the book because, in a sense, it was almost like a political decision. Yeah. Do you really want to tell everyone that inflation is good for government debt? Yeah, but that's my second point. I mean, uh, I, I'm always thinking about political economy. I'm always uh, trying to think how the distribution of gains and losses uh, will translate into. Uh, politics and into right. economic policy or uh, policy more generally. And I wonder if you discuss this at all in your book. I mean, if mm -hmm. you, uh, because uh, uh, then we will have to find the trans transmissions, uh, transmission mechanisms, let's call it like this, from the distribution of gain and losses into politics and policy. Yeah. Have you, do you have some ideas on this? Well, part of it in the short term, the, the, and the United States is a really good example. So you probably heard about this disconnect between the way the economy is performing and the perception of the economy with American voters. So basically, the sort of democratically aligned top 10% who run newspapers and everything in the United States are basically having kittens because they don't understand why normal Americans don't understand the economy is doing great. Well, this is, goes back to this problem of like averages, right? So, you know, unemployment's at 4%. Yeah, but in my town in the Midwest, it's 11%. Uh, yeah, but absolutely, but wages are rising. Mm, not unless you're doing Deliveroo or Uber, right? 
Uh, so what about wage contracting? What about when I go to the supermarket? My favorite example of this is a mayonnaise company in the United States called Hellman's, right? They make all the mayo. And for the longest time, these jars of mayo this size was $4.99. It is now $7.99 and it's not coming down. Now what we found in the research for the book when we started to think, did the whole long thing on expectations, which could just be a talk on its own, is that what people actually anchor on in surveys are two things. It's six month expectations on groceries, like if you ask them to map out where they think their groceries, and it's the fan charts like this, it's all over, they're literally clueless, right? But the one thing they get right is the forward price of gasoline. Because they use cars every day, and they see the price on the pump. So you're literally giving them an information feed and just asking them to base an update. So that becomes actually incredibly accurate, right? Now, when you've got an economy whereby you're sort of, I hate to use the phrase, but your elites basically are telling you everything's great because for them it is. I mean, it's great in Brooklyn. Brooklyn's lovely just now, right? But most of us don't live in Brooklyn. And when they interpret the economy through a vastly different set of metrics, which are completely different from the metrics that you're supposed to, according to the people who tell you what the inflation rate is, there's a huge disconnect. And the people at the top literally can't see this. So the political economy of this is inflation is amplifying Trumpism in a way that the people who understand inflation officially literally can't see. Right? That's one of the consequences that goes through that. In terms of the government debt one is the government, the, the sort of like the nominal GDP increase relative to the debt stock, right, is only really true if you sustain it for a long time. So if you think about the post-World War II period, right, you have heavy financial repression. I hate that name because it implies that like, banks are like Bambi. They're normally free unless we repress them, which is a really weird way of thinking about things. But we didn't used to allow banks to do whatever they wanted. And what that meant was credit was kind of scarce. You could then use credit as a control valve for the economy, and this is the way we did it. right? Now, when you've got that and you have a big pile of debt after World War II, a little inflation goes a long way. So if I'm growing at 3% and the, nomin and the nominal, uh, nominal GDP is at 3% and inflation's at 4%, if I run that for 20 years, I'm gonna destroy half my debt. The second dynamic is the so-called R over G, right? The rate of growth in the debt stock relative to, nominal, to the rate of growth in the economy. And so long as I've got higher growth in that than I have the debt I'm issuing at the same time as positive inflation, it just disappears. And this is what happened after World War II, but it basically took about 25 years to go from, in the US case, 164% down to about 35%. Now, during that whole period, right, you would think about this in terms of the austerity language that you were all were used to, you know, or we think about in Europe, that that must have been the worst time ever. Oh my God, you had all that debt, and you had all that debt, and you had to pay it off. Yeah, it was also the boom time for the American economy. It was also what the French called Le Trente Glorieuse. It's also what the Italians called Il Boom, which is very cute, <laughs> right? That was the best of times. And in the best of times, because the economy was growing fast with high, relatively high inflation, you just destroyed debt. I'm not sure we live in that world because the inflation, at least until we get to that, isn't going to persist fast enough. And the other one is we've got underlying low growth. So you don't get to have the high growth and a little bit more inflation, which allows you to eat it off. What you've got is low growth, so a little inflation actually becomes a drag. And then you add the distributional politics onto this. Most people at the bottom end of the income distribution, the ones who are affected the most, that's when you get shitty politics. So that's how it plays out, I think, differently this way. At the back. Oh, I'm do more. I haven't kept them long enough. I'm kidding. Uh, hi, Mark. Hello. So uh, I've noticed that you taught at University of Birmingham, and obviously yes. you're a broom. Well, yes. <laughs> Good on you, lass. Yeah. So um, it's quite interesting this topic because it kind of links to my uh, field work that I'm actually doing in the UK. Great. And my specific case study is actually on Birmingham. City Council in terms of their bankruptcy. Oh yeah, and yeah, the bankruptcy pay. of the local council, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So at the moment, locally, like the taxes are going up, inflation is hitting the UK big time, and mm -hmm. obviously local residents are now feeling it. So I'm just wondering, in terms of like your research and like your like, what what are your views in terms of that at the moment? <laughs> so, <laughs> considering all that, yeah, it'd be no, interesting just to no, know. No, no, happy, happy to chat, yeah. put it in, put it in a bigger context, right? 
So what were, what were local governments originally conceived as, right? So if you go back to just before World War II, the British state taxed and spent between 9% and 11% of GDP. And 11% was the height of the arms buildup before World War II. So prior to that, they're spending like less than 10% of GDP. There isn't a state, right? There's something that manages the foreign and commonwealth, the foreign and empire office, and, and builds a few things and puts up prisons, and that's basically it, right? So after the war, one of the ways that you're able to create the post-war welfare state is a massive expansion of local governments and their, and their fiscal capacities and responsibilities. What happens after a while, particularly once you get into the, sort of the, the post-Thatcher era, is that these things just become too expensive relative to where you want your tax thresholds to be. And then when you get to the austerity period, oh, this is where you cut. You see, you don't need to cut in London. Osborne wasn't just a hypocrite. He was also like targeting his hypocrisy in that you don't need to cut Westminster because everyone has money, so nobody uses Westminster services. But everybody in Preston lives on Westminster services, so if you cut that, you end up cutting, on a local basis, 30% of GDP on a local basis, which is absolutely catastrophic. I mean, that's the end of the Soviet Union levels of cuts, right? And the result of that was that these councils, if they wanted to do anything, they were given more freedom. And it's just like British universities, right? So you cap the level of fees, and then you say, you're on your own. And then they all go on a huge building expansion and do all these things. And then they're like, shit, we're never going to make enough money with these fees. What are we going to do? Let's go to China. So then you bring in lots of foreign students, right? And then you discover, like, tourism, that's pretty volatile, right? You do something moronic like Brexit, and guess what? You're all long and wrong. It's very similar to what happened with the councils. So they tried a whole variety of strategies of privatization and basically investment into housing and a whole bunch of stuff. Uh, private equity investments, I mean, all, all sorts of dodgy stuff. And most of it, surprise, surprise, didn't pay off. Now, why didn't it pay off? If you haven't read this book, I totally recommend you get it. Do you know Brett Christopher's book, Ronte Capitalism? Yes, no, no, read it, right? It goes sector by sector through the British economy, because Brett used to be, he's now an, uh, an economic geographer, he used to be a sell-side analyst for a big, for a city firm, right? So he knows how to read corporate balance sheets. So he basically goes through and basically figures out how concentrated these markets are, et cetera, et cetera, and does it sector by sector through the economy. And what you've got is, a, a, um, imagine local councils, right? Local councils maybe have a legal department, a top legal department of four people. So how good are they? Well, you know, they can probably get somebody who's squatting out. They can probably, like, you know, arrange a new car park for you. Are they going to be anything against Trafalgar's legal department, who basically have 100 top lawyers? And their only job is to get that 10-year infrastructure contract from the government to run water on the terms that they want. You're legally massively outgunned. So you sign these things because you think it's going to be good for you. And then the hand comes in. And then you're left carrying the bag. And that's what's happened right across the local government sector in the UK. It's an absolute scandal. But that's really what it was. That's what happened in a nutshell. These things were never meant to be private sector entities. And you gave them balance sheet responsibilities of a company without any of the capacity to borrow or lend or do any of the stuff that you would need to to do that. They end up utterly reliant on a sector which basically just sees them as targets. And they went in and defenestrated them. And that's, that's what happened. You're welcome. That's it. Just write that. You're good. <laughs> Yeah, go on. Um, hello, Mark. Thank hello. you for your talk. So I was wondering, um, we essentially got the hammer here in Europe, the uh, interest rate increases, even yeah. though there's growing evidence of a supply side problem. And uh, well, we have to do with the hammer anyway. But there's also the issue of the exchange rate to, to USD because there was the increase in the, the exchange in the interest rate in the, the US as well. Yep. So there's like a combination of forces here going one at another. Yep. Do you think there was an alternative to raising the interest rates? I, I, in think, I think it's even more interesting than this, which is the following. Remember those interest rates were meant to cause a massive recession. They didn't. When you raise something 22 times from base, it matters where the base is, and the base was zero. So for most of the time that we were raising interest rates, they were still negative relative to where inflation was in many places. So this was not Volcker, where you just come in and just, right? 
Now, the way the central banks played this is really interesting. And there's a, this is another story that we do in the book. We call it the bystander hypothesis, right? And basically, it's like, okay, central banks, disinflation, independence, there's all the econometric work. You can go look at this stuff, right? And if you take it on its own terms, it tells a very clear story. That before, between 1980 and about 1999, there's actually a statistically significant effect on if you have an independent central bank, you have less inflation and you have faster deflation, right? After 1999, there's no effect anywhere, right? So what else was going on in that period? Oh, let's see, the globalization of finance, the entry of China into the global economy, a massive deflation of wages, all of these things that might cause fast deflationary processes. So if you basically do the econometrics again with all the countries that don't have them, yes, you see the difference, but it's not actually that clear that what's really driving it is central bank policy, right? So once you do that, you begin to say to yourselves, are these folks really that powerful? Well, we know Volcker is. He's got his hands on the levers of the global savings asset, right? That matters. Bank of England, about 95% of what the Bank of England does is just a reflection of what the Fed did two days earlier, right? So if that's the case, are these things really that powerful? <laughs> Secondly, the way they spin the story is brilliant because they were all the time aiming for a soft landing. No, you weren't. You're just saying that because you got lucky. Right? Show me causally that this raise of interest rates designed to cause exactly these outcomes, which you couldn't foresee and didn't foresee. So there's a question as to what extent was this actually powerful that time around, or does it actually expose a kind of a weakness, which is actually even more interesting. We've delegated so much of our responsibilities to central banks on the assumption that they can do stuff. But what they can do is make money more expensive or cheaper, and they can buy and sell assets to make money more expensive or cheaper. That's basically it. And you know, it's the hammer and the nail. Not everything is a money more expensive, cheaper problem. What Britain faces is not a money expensive or cheap problem. It's the fact you haven't invested in infrastructure since 1870, right? So those are things that central banks can't fix. And if it turns out that they're actually even less powerful than we think, it's like very much, you know, the Wizard of Oz, don't look behind the curtain, we control interest rates, but actually it's a whole bunch of other stuff that really matters. Woo, right? That's really dangerous because we've got governments that are convinced that they can't do fiscal policy, they shouldn't do fiscal policy, and if they do, they'll get it wrong. Leave it to the experts. What if the experts don't really have the controls they think they do? And I think there's very good evidence, or through this, this period, that we can kind of show that they don't really have the control they think they do. They're making it up as they go along, and the big recession never happened, even in Europe. So I think that it's... it's it's, there are alternatives, number one, which are distributionally better, but the fact is, it didn't even work on its own terms. And there's a lot of information in that that we're yet to digest. Gentlemen behind? Bring us home, sir. Close us out. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You okay. got it. Okay. okay, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for your talk. Thanks a lot for your book. Uh, by the way, I came in a little late, so I missed out on the title of the book and when it will be out. So oh, right. So it's uh, Inflation, a Guide for Users and Losers. And it will be out probably around May next year because in the United States, this is literally what happens with publications now, right? Because it's an election year, nobody publishes anything between now and next March because it's all just all about the election. So you can release it, nobody cares. And then once everyone's kind of like tired of it and is sick of the whole thing, then they'll start reading books again. You start publishing in the spring after it. So that's why it comes out then. You'll need to switch it on again. Yeah, I think, yeah. I think yeah, you're that. good. There's like a three second delay. Uh, thanks for that. Uh, my other question slash comment is I wanted to slightly challenge you on something. So sure. I really, obviously I really liked the whole talk. I obviously agree with the whole greedy corporations are a major part of the story line, certainly. But I did notice that you hardly mentioned uh, supply chain disruptions. Right. And you hardly mentioned the war in Ukraine and the effect on food, fertilizers, uh, totally. and fuel. And if you bring, and, and at the same time, I also wanted to point out that obviously greedy corporations with high markups they've existed for a long time. Yeah. So if you bring these two together, you're kind of led to ask the question, why didn't these corporations start the process of profit right. light inflation sooner? So really my question is, is your story, if you develop, develop yeah. it a little deeper, is your story that there was this spark and this spark created noise around the price system 
and greedy corporations took advantage of the noise yeah, in the I price system? Yeah. I don't think they're actually, I, I would say that too. I, mean, like, I don't think they're greedy. I don't think greedy is a useful word, right? Right. It's just, it's, it's just basically they're protecting their margins, right? If you're a large corporation, you're not protecting your margins, you shouldn't be running a corporation. Like, I totally get it, right? It's capitalism. That's what you do. You're there to make profits, right? So what does inflation allow you to do? Inflation creates, if you were, a kind of uh, an interesting stack, for those who are economists, an interesting Stackelberger equilibrium problem, right? Because ultimately what you've got is a bunch of firms that are sitting there going, I'd love to cooperate with you and get more money out of these people, but you might stab me in the back. So I could adjust on prices or I could adjust on quantities. And if you think about the supply shock as essentially an, ex an exogenous quantity adjustment, what it does is it shoves the Stackelberger in an information poor environment. Not information poor for the corporations, but for everybody else. And at that point, it's like, you know, we can do this. So all you need is one to do it and the other one to do it. And then you start to get the data and the data, the feedback is earnings calls. So you start to get these earnings calls coming in 21. It's like, oh, we're doing great. We got so much money. It's ridiculous. And everyone else is like, well, why have they got so much money? It's like, well, look what they did on prices. So pff, you pile in. So you need to basically shove the equilibrium into that sort of on the consumer side, informationally poor environment, and then you can get it. You can't do it all the time. However, in a sense, they do. What's the point in being concentrated? The point of being concentrated is that you're not subject to market pressures. So I'll give you an example of this, right? Think about a supposedly competitive market. European aviation. Now, it's true that you can crawl over broken glass and pay to use the toilet if you want to go through that airline that flies out of Ireland, right? But think about your major carriers. You go on any website, they're all within $5 of each other, all the time, without disruption. It's just tacit price setting because they can, because amongst the, the bigger carriers, there's really no competition. There's broken glass or there's pay a premium, and everybody pays a premium. So in a sense, they are actually doing it all the time. It's just that this allows you to do it even more in that regard. What was your, your, your other one, your other question? It was, it wasn't just that, it was something else. Was that basically it? So all right, so that's how, that's how I would think about it that way. Actually, one thing, let me just do this in closing. I just want to finish up this bit off. Sorry, oh, I well, I killed it. All right, I'll tell you the last bit. Um, yeah, it's fine. Um, there's two, this, I did, I did, and this is, this is really helpful because I now know how to structure the talk better. So there's two, two or three Volcker stories. The first Volcker story was Volcker is the hero, right? And the second one about the 70s was Nixon failed. So here's the real kicker on this thing. Nixon didn't fail. What they did was they made prices, price control voluntary. And at that point, firms in highly concentrated markets went, watch this, and they went for it. And at the same time, you still have pretty highly organized labor in those firms, vertically integrated for this classic American firms. Boom, they went for it as well. And that's when you get that huge rise. It's not that controls failed, it's that they stopped using them as controls. So there's a really important lesson in that part of it as well. And the second one is there's a whole alternative history of the 1970s, which we also get a lot in this book. But there's a whole alternative history of the 70s, which is essentially this, right? 1967, you start fighting Vietnam for real. This is a huge budgetary expense, which is all off budget, right? Interesting, they did the same thing with Iraq, but it didn't have an inflationary effect. Why? Back then, you had many more people fighting, and you had much more of your production in an oil-centric economy directed to this. So you've just got massive constraints. You're really hitting supply-side constraints. When you're not acknowledging those budgetary costs, they've got to go up, show up somewhere, and they start to show up in producer prices, and that starts to go through, right? 1967 through 69, something else happens. Women and minorities are incorporated in the labor market scale for the first time in American history. Now, that should be deflationary because you're increasing the supply of labor. But these, are very, these aren't white males who are biled in a house in the burbs. What they are is consumers as well as workers. So they actually add to the consumption because there isn't enough capital deepening. They're not forming households in the same way or whatever, right? So you actually get more consumption in the economy, right? 1969, 71, and 73, three failed harvests in Canada, the USSR, and the United States in wheat, food prices start to go up. 74, you get the oil shock. 78, you put mortgages in the American CPI, which just boosts the index like mad. And then in 79, you get the second oil shock. So for, if you've ever been to London, the story about London getting a bus is you never get a bus and then eight of them show up at once, right? That was the 1970s. It was all supply shocks, but they all hit sequentially. Now, each of them has its own decay function. But when you slam them together, you massively complicate the decay function. So what looks like a decade of inflation is actually a series of discrete special shocks.
And if you see it this way, Volcker becomes irrelevant, if not harmful, because what he does is he comes at the end of what is already a deflationary process and massively hikes up rates, deregulates the banking sector, pleases his constituents, and massively changes the direction of the American economy. And I think that's actually the real sort of story that's like in this that we want to tell. So thank you for helping me clarify what the hell the book's about. So that's good. <laughs> thank you. Thank, thank you, you Mike. Staying. Thank you. All right.